Okay, good morning, everyone. We are in Genesis 15. Thanks for being here this morning. I was just reflecting this week how this Bible study time is actually my favorite moment of the week. I really enjoy this time together, just trying to learn more and dig deeper, have great discussions about scripture. It's a lot of fun. So here we are in Genesis 15. We went through the first six verses and we said we would come back to them as we started this week. And so where we are is... God has promised to Abram and Sarai multiple times that they are going to be the parents of this great nation. And so we talked about how we had this break from the prehistoric into the historic. And even though we are now in this historical moment, there is still barrenness. The story of God's relation to humanity is, can the promises that God makes in the midst of barrenness come true? And the promises are given without any evidence that they're actually going to come true. And the promises are made again and again, and yet Abram and Sarai continue to go through these experiences, go into foreign lands like Egypt, leave their homeland, wander, and yet they're still supposed to trust. And I really liked our discussion last week, and Robin, it was you who said that The promise is made again and again, and nothing really changes here. There's not new evidence. God says, look at the stars, but how is he supposed to believe that really his progeny are going to be as numerous as the stars? And yet somehow he then believes, and we're going to get into some of the Hebrew words here that we said we would look at for verse six. There's really no new evidence. And the story of faith, of Abram, the story of faith that we see in the New Testament, where so often with the disciples, Jesus has to tell them, oh, ye of little faith, that even with God incarnate in front of them, even witnessing the miracles of Christ, they aren't able to believe in full either. And Jesus has to continually remind him, you're someone of of little faith, and Abram, here I am making these promises. So the story of faith is not one of finality. It's not a possession of an object known as faith. And once you have that within your possession, then you somehow are a person of faith. It is a constant back and forth, a constant journey to believe the promise, even in the midst of no evidence. And so God takes Abram outside and invites him to count the stars and says, this shall be your descendants in number And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. As we were just kind of surmising last week, we thought perhaps this reckoned or accounted, what version are we in? New Revised Standard Update Edition. So accounted or reckoned, we thought maybe it was an accounting term, um, and it's not. So the Hebrew word that's used here is one that is just kind of a basic term for considered, often it's translated as strived or basically just thought of. So it's not necessarily an accounting term, but more of um, a God thought of or considered Abram as righteous. Um, So it's kind of a perspective shift that Abram is finally able to believe this, and God considers Abram as righteous or has a perspective shifted or decides that Abram is considered righteous. And this word for righteousness, um, the Hebrew is sadekah, um, and this is a word that's often used in the Hebrew Bible, and it's meant to have a tie-in with the concept of justice. Um, that righteousness comes from justice, that when you are just and you live equitably, then that is righteous living. And so it is Abram's attempt at imperfect faith that God thinks of Abram as someone who is righteous. So there's not a lot of accounting here. It's not necessarily too illuminating to look at the Hebrew to give us more of a context for what this means. But as we said, this very verse has been used by theologians throughout Christian history to speak of this idea of being justified by faith alone and not by works, that through Abram's faith, he's considered righteous. 
And of course, there's going to be a lot of dialogue within Christian history, even in the New Testament, as you get the example of James coming in, faith without works is dead, that yes, we have faith, but our faith leads us to just actions. Again, even if our actions are imperfect, just like our faith is imperfect, our faith does lead us to righteous acts, um, even as God already considers us righteous. Questions or comments about those first six I verses? I have a question, I guess. Um, Buffett and I were talking about this uh, last time we got. It seems like this scene is parallel to the scene where God says, what's your work? It's that all this land will be yours. And that isn't where um, Abraham leaves David is better to be his righteous gifts. And now God says, like, if that weren't fast enough, why work at the sky? I'm just thinking about the like the land didn't quite do it for Abram, but the offspring did. And, yeah. and the metaphors, like looking at the fall of the heavens, is so sublime and staggering. You know, to the land where it was like, here's our land. Mm. 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 Yeah. Kevin's observation is the last scene that parallels this, the promise is told that you can look to the north and south and east and west and as far as your gaze will take you this will be the land that you and your progeny will occupy and that's not enough for Abram and yet there's this moment of looking into the skies which is a much vaster expanse than what you can see via the horizon and this sort of sublime experience is what leads him to finally believe yeah yeah very interesting that it takes that much the promise has to be as big as the cosmos to believe that it's true any other comments or questions yeah diane i just uh, it struck me how after already seeing that explanation do not be afraid mm. Yeah. So Diane says we're seeing the contours of that repeated phrase when there's an interaction between the divine and the human of be not afraid. That we'll get again and again in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Robin? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, when this text is being compiled into written form, um, they're able to put place names or markers in. We've seen this already in Genesis where there's references to people groups that don't exist yet. And so the Chaldeans are kind of um, the proto-Babylonians that it will kind of become the Babylonians. And so they're kind of giving a marker here that this city of Ur um, is later going to be the region of the Chaldeans, um, even if that concept doesn't necessarily exist yet. Um, so we've just got kind of general people in the region that are going to become these groups, but not necessarily are those groups yet. So he is, um, you know, ostensibly a Canaanite, just like all the other people there. There's no separate Hebrew people yet until we get to Abraham and they then consider themselves a new Hebrew people. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, as, as can ostensibly all the people. Um, and then the divergences come from, you know, Cain versus Seth, Ham, Shem, and Jepheth. So the it, it diverges. So the Hebrews are going to say, well, we come from a lineage that traces to Jepheth and then you know, back through Seth. And you all go to Cain. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Great observation. Thought I saw one more hand up, maybe. Okay. Um, so then God said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. 
But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All right. So what has happened? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Donna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what the heck? What the heck? So this is a way that covenants were sealed in the ancient Near East. So what's happening here is a very common practice. So after you would make a covenant, so we'll get into this in another passage later. We'll go extensively. I've mentioned the term suzerainty treaty before. Um, so the way treaties and covenants would um, be written is that at the very end of the treaty, there would be a stipulation of blessings that people would receive if they kept the covenant and a stipulation of curses that they would experience if they broke the covenant. And they would seal the covenant through a sacrifice of blood. And often what they would do is they would take these animals, they would cut them in half, they would line up the pieces and both parties would walk in between the pieces. And one of the curses would be, if you break this covenant, may you wind up like the carcasses of these animals. And so you're visually seeing these dead animals next to you, thinking that if I break this covenant, I'm going to wind up like this as well. So this is a way that covenants were sealed in the ancient Near East. Is that that there was a surplus of food at that time for the animals? A surplus of food or animals? I mean, probably, most certainly, there's not. Um, if we're willing to sacrifice to make this. Yeah, they had enough animals for sacrifices. Yeah. Say again, Toby. It'd be there's the scarcity of this type of wealth that would make it mm. very Toby, yeah, to yeah. Sacrifice. Toby's saying if there were a scarcity, and I'm not exactly sure if there was, then it would signify that it was an even greater value that it was worth sacrificing it for the sake of the covenant. Yeah, that's a, a good thought. I was thinking that it might be because um, he's expressing doubt and <clears throat> God is saying, well, this is how you're going to know it. And uh, wasn't there a form of divination with little red entrails of animals that were sliced open like this? It doesn't, it's kind of breaks off too. So, you know, I think later we're not supposed to do horuspis or whatever it's called. Um, maybe they you know, kind of got the excited out and that would explain the abruptness there. Yeah, that was a practice. So there were several forms of divination of how people would try to predict the future. And one of them is going to be kind of codified within the Hebrew Bible of casting the umim and the thumim to decide how they land. And that will decide how casting lots. We'll see that phrase a lot. But looking at entrails was another way. So that could potentially be what's happening here. But we do know that this exact practice was something that was done as well. But I think that could definitely be in play. James? Question. Why did they cut the birds in two? Are birds symbolic of something specific or? Oh. So why did they not cut the birds in two? Yeah, I just thought that was weird that they were like specified that they had to do that to the birds. So. Yeah. So most likely the reason being, you know, the, the turtle dove and the young pigeon were 
very common sacrifices because it was easier to get your hands on a turtle dove and a pigeon. So perhaps they're not cutting the birds in two because after this ritual, they're going to sacrifice them in Thanksgiving or gratitude. So that's one thought I have of why not, but you're right. They do make a point of saying they are not cutting it. So there's a reason for that. And I think it might be just because this is being, if we have a priestly author editing this, they're going to try to make it clear. Like they held off and didn't do the birds because they sacrificed that later. It was a common Thanksgiving offering. They had different terms for these offerings. So the birds were a common Thanksgiving offering. Yeah, Diane? I make a comment for my husband. He won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he commented that in verse 6, it says, and he believed the Lord, Abraham believed the Lord. And then you go down in uh, right below. No, go back up. And <laughs> uh, verse 8, he says, oh Lord, how am I to mm. possess it? So there's a <laughs> in fact, it, it, it's kind of reassuring in a way that in the midst of our faith and belief, and also it's this, this question. Yeah. Um, not disbelief. Yeah. Beautifully said. Thank you, Hugh and <laughs> Diane. Um, so, yeah, great observation, Hugh. And Diane, you said something similar last week as well, and I thought that was profound. Again, we have this tension, this interplay between faith and doubt. You're right. Abram believes it's credited to him as righteousness, and then he still has questions. You know, show me, help me believe. How do I know that I'm going to possess it? And those questions still come, reassuring to the rest of us that this is how faith works. Okay, so we're doing this ritual. Yeah, Kevin. Well, just quickly, I mean, I think it clarifies what I was trying to say before, which is it seems like the promise of offspring, the promise of the land, the two separate things, mm. it's fine, but God gives God, it's still not clear on the side of it. Yeah, yeah. And why, if you can use one of them, if it's why not the other? Years. Yeah, so the belief comes about the progeny, but then the doubt is about the land, and so why would he not believe both things? Is he really nervous about how he's going to take this land? Donna? Did he possess, did they possess that land because they got the prophecy of them being there to possess? Or were there things in some form of greater understanding? Um, you mean at this point or later, like how they will possess the land? Yeah. Oh, did they possess the land? They were living in this very open, uh, again, rustic setting. Well, as, as is noted in this passage, and we'll talk about what this means in a minute, Abram is told that he's not going to possess it until he comes back to the area after 400 years of slavery, which is a reference to their time in Egypt. Now, this is written post the Egyptian exile? So the oral tradition is going to be in existence since the time of Abram. The written it's text... Exactly. It's going exactly. It's going to be written down. The oral tradition is going to exist. It's not going to be written down in this form with this foreshadowing until the exile. And I'm going to raise my <laughs> typical point. I find the language very interesting. The sun is going down deep sleep fell upon Abram and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. That's the language we use now for mental illness. Hmm. Hmm. So Toby says this idea of a deep and terrifying darkness is part of the language we would use for mental illness, perhaps a moment of depression. <coughs> yeah, very curious. Let's talk about that. So we have this ritual that we know about in the ancient Near East where this is how covenants are sealed. You cut animals in half, you walk between the pieces, both parties, and they recite the blessings and the curses for what will happen if the covenant is kept or not kept. Knowing that, how is this scene different than what I just described? There is one major difference. Both oh. parties don't confess in that. Yeah, both parties don't walk the path here. Because 
what happens? It's what you were touching on, Toby. I'm sorry, I'm not following. So in the typical ritual, both parties signing the covenant would walk through the carcasses. But in our passage, only one party does. And which party is it? It's not Abram. It's God. It's the smoking pot. The only thing that goes through the carcass pieces are the smoking pot and torch. Abram falls asleep. Thoughts on what's going on here? Mm -hmm. yeah 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 great I, I think you're answering the what's going on for sure so yeah surely yeah we talked about that with the noachic the no covenant made with noah is that often these covenants made with God, while humanity is involved and is meant to uphold the covenant, that it is often unilateral and unconditional. And so rather than invite Abraham to walk through the carcasses and for God to say, Abraham, if you break this covenant, you're going to end up like these carcasses too. God puts Abram into this deep sleep. Kevin says this, making him think of the deep sleep of Abram when the rib is removed, that while you are sleeping, God is going to be part of this creative process. And that's what's happening here is God is establishing this covenant unilaterally, declaring, Abram, you could be sleeping, you could be totally off the job, not paying attention, not part of it, but I'm still going to keep the covenant with you. Robin? So in other passages, we're going to covenant even unilateral. Well, they're not. It's not always unilateral. You do what I say. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. follow my, my boss. And he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. He just tells me, I'm going to be with you. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be with you. And Abram's like, real? Like, <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't ask anything of it. So when you talk about it being a covenant, you know, I mean, Abram's part of the covenant is here's the heifer, here's the goat, here's the whatever. I don't know what all the characters were, but <laughs> you know, he provides the animals, but mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, on on the promise of something that's gonna happen hundreds of years after he's dead. And God kind of makes that clear too. The only thing that Abraham gets is you will have a child. Yeah. And to me, the way Abraham responds to that earlier passage when you know God showed him the stars. You can see that that's what Abraham really wants. Mm. And it's like you can have all this land, I mean, all this land. It's like somehow none of that's going to happen either. But it's like this: I want, I want a child so much that he he does believe that God shows him that it's like okay, that touches my heart. Yeah. And that, I, I don't know. And yeah. what can we really know? But somehow just the way it's written, I don't mm. have a sense that's mm. what Abraham mm. wants. But mm. God's not asking. He's not asking anything of him, really. Yeah. Not yeah. No. And except for faith, except to belief in the covenant. That. It doesn't even say that you have to have that first. You're right. Um, I mean, he's still of it. And Abraham does. Abraham listens to him for sure. But, but he's not saying, yeah. like, you keep believing in me here, you keep trusting in me. Yeah. So as we think about other covenants made throughout the Old Testament, for example, the Davidic covenant, um, there are stipulations to keeping your family line on the throne. Those stipulations are broken, and ostensibly God still upholds the covenant through the mm -hmm. eternal king of Jesus. Um, but here... And with Noah, it wasn't so much either that stipulations, it was, here's the promise of the rainbow. I'm not going to do this in the same way ever again. But there's really not much asked of Abram. And Robin is pointing out that sort of the, you're always good at kind of digging emotions out of the text. I really love that. Um, 
the idea that it seems like what Abram is really wanting here is this child. And so that's what he can have belief in the land, not so much. He doesn't know how he's going to possess it, but this very, it's not even going to come for hundreds of years, but this very uh, tangible personal promise is what he's relying on. And then Genesis 16, he's going to disbelieve the promise of the child. We're going to get the laughing at the promise. We're going to get Hagar and Ishmael. And so even then the interplay of faith and doubt comes in. James, you had your hand up. Oh, um, okay, um, oh, um, I was going to say that I don't agree with the point necessarily that there isn't any stipulation here. Yeah, yeah. Because the foreshadowing that we mentioned earlier about the 400 years and everything, that's a stipulation. That's mm. why I'm setting up the rules right there. Mm. He's saying that's what's going to happen. I mean, maybe it's not a direct stipulation that's going to affect Abraham right away, but it's going to affect what comes down line, what ultimately has been promised, I would say that's a stipulation. Okay. So not necessarily an expectation made of Abraham, but definitely an, a, a stipulation of how it's going to come, when it's going to come, how you're going to experience it. Yeah. Um, so everyone understands the reference to 400 years. So that's going to be what we're told is the length of time of slavery in Egypt. So this is a direct reference to that. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Very problematic verse that's going to be used to justify the genocide that is to come. And so um, when you're attempting to defend scriptural as scripture as literal from a fundamentalist perspective, you then have to come up with ways to explain away the problematic aspects of the text. And so when you look at God condoning, endorsing, commanding the slaughtering of every man, woman, and child as the Israelites come into this promised land, folks will point to a verse like this and say, well, God was punishing them for their sins. Not a very satisfying justification because then you then have to believe that God wipes people out for their sins. Um, so, but this is the sort of verse that's going to be pointed out. And so the suggestion is that the Amorites are going to be wiped out, but God's going to do so as punishment once their sin continues to build up and it's time to get rid of the Amorites. So justification for the slaughter that the Israelites are putting into the text as well. And they have to live with themselves and the actions that they've taken to take this promised land because they are wiping out other people groups, which is how war functioned back then, is you annihilated your opponent. And so the Israelites do that and then read into it that this was the command of God. All right, a bit of heaviness with that verse. So God often appears as fire and cloud and smoke. Interesting that the sun has gone down and it's dark. So it is a light in the darkness. So that sort of light and darkness metaphor that is at play is the reason why God comes down as fire as the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness, it's going to be a pillar of cloud by day and then fire at night so that there is guidance. There is a path that is illuminated in the darkness through this fire pot or flaming torch. All right. Questions, comments about this ritual here? <laughs> Yeah. Big question. Is that what you imagine as you think about it? That's what I imagine. Kind of a floating fire pot. Mm -hmm. So is the torch coming out of the fire pot or is it fire pot and then a torch or 
As I was reading it, I said, I hope no, someone doesn't ask me that because I don't know. <laughs> I had the same question. Well, it can't be a mistake with nature. You know, we yeah. make sure that it's not mistaken that way. Oh, that goes to you. Oh yeah, uh, you know it's it's really fascinating once you, you know, for on one end you have kind of the attempt to justify literal interpretations, but then there's on the opposite end for folks who are um, wanting to read the text as completely scientific and naturalistic with no possibility of supernatural miracles then it's fun to kind of see those readings like how do you explain away all the miracles what natural phenomenons are, ha are happening there are a lot of really interesting um what's the word i'm looking for like atmospheric and ecological phenomenon that that can explain some of this stuff so yeah i don't know that one but interesting oh a haboob a desert oh, storm yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah but that's just Dirt and rain and other things carry. There's no fire involved. Yeah, yeah, interesting. You can't, you can't drive it. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, for the church service? Yes. What's your question? Definitely. You asked it beautifully. I know exactly what you're asking. Okay, yeah. We can save that. We can tackle in there, do a devotion on it, talk about it in here. Yeah, good question. Um, a turtle had it on the back of his back. A turtle had it on his back. And that's funny. I like that. Wendy's answer for how the, the pot moves, it's on the back of a turtle. So, <laughs> too many kindergarten books. Um, you know, what could be going on here? So something very interesting as it plays out in the New Testament. So in Zechariah, we have this prophecy of the Messiah coming on the back of a colt, of a donkey in the cult of a donkey. All right. Zechariah, in its prophetic, poetic language, was using a very common rhetorical device whereby you repeat something that is intended to refer to the same thing, but you describe that thing in two different ways. So when it says the Messiah comes on a donkey, the cult of a donkey, it's attempting to poetically say one donkey, but use two different terms to describe that one donkey. And then we get our New Testament folks who are attempting to describe the Messiah using the language of the prophetic material who aren't versed in Hebrew poetry. And they put a donkey and the cult of a donkey in one of the gospels on the scene, thinking that's what's supposed to be there because of the words of Zechariah. Another gospel writer doesn't do that. So that's kind of one interesting discrepancy or contradiction here. I don't know if that's what's happening. Again, I'd have to go back and look at the text, but it could be a way to just describe one thing using two different words. How's that for inerrancy? Yeah, how's that for inerrancy to get to Diana's point? Yeah, James? I guess I was just telling him, but I guess I see it as much more kind of what you're talking about right now, poetic, metaphorical. That's a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. I think of these things as like what you were saying, facing the darkness, mm -hmm. the idea of the soul or the heart, Abram and God together is like that. Well, we're going back about, about justice and righteousness, that it's more metaphorical and symbolic. There's yeah. not like any flaming torch actually passing between it, but it's the idea that there's this bond between God and Abraham now that's being manifested that mm. light in the darkness. Yeah, definitely. And I think that the, the author is this oral tradition. The author is writing it down very much that in mind. So did this happen? Literally, was there a fire pot? Was there a flaming torch? 
I don't know, there could have been. Um, regardless, that metaphor is very much intended here. So that was really beautifully said. So this, this really intimate moment between Abram and God of this promise of the light and the darkness. The promise is there. You don't know how it's going to happen, but I will illuminate it. Trust, have faith. Yeah, that's beautiful. All right, anything else on Genesis 15? Just want ben? to add that at the end, um, where it talks about the land specifically that Abram's descendants will possess. It says from be from the Nile to the Euphrates. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in um, Reverend Mugrise's book that I finished up long ago, he talks about how, well, what land, and this is one definition, but it's mm. given de different definitions in different biblical passages. And it's yeah. one of those things that is problematic about trying to find you know, the biblical promised land. Yeah, so, yeah, great point. So Ben's saying, um, reading this Palestinian pastor, Christian pastor's book, and the promise of what is the promised land has different definitions throughout scripture. And that definitely plays into modern political discourse, because if you're using scripture to justify the promise, the promise and the contours of the land are different in so many different places. Um, it can become quite small. It can become quite big. Yeah, especially if you're naming somebody like Mike Huckabee to be the ambassador to Israel, and he's saying there's no such thing as the West Bank, there's only Judea and Samaria, there's no such thing as settlers. It's just communities and very, very <laughs> uh, genocidal, again, uh, you know, uh, perspective on communities of the unique peoples. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks, Ben. Gosh. Um, scary, real, something to have in front of our face these next four years. Okay, let's um, read this passage, even if we don't get to discuss it too much. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. The promise has not come to pass. Promise nothing. Promise nothing. Promise nothing. She had an Egyptian slave whose name was Hagar, and Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, your slave is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she ran away from her. Oh, if this isn't human relationships as we experience it as we saw it with adam and eve when fingers got pointed um let's take three minutes and and dig in and ask some questions so the language here is very intentional um the promise has not yet come to pass and what happens to abram in verse two that i think is very intentional Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Just as, Adam to Just as Adam listened to Eve. Yeah. And who is writing this? And who is writing this book? Whenever something goes wrong, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The women are blamed here. Um, I think the author of the text is trying to say Abram's listening to Sarai and not to God. However, what's missing is his own agency, and he's not going to take responsibility for that agency at all, because he's then going to say to her, well, it's your slave, you deal with it. So we've just got a lot of really complicated emotions and relationships here. So the fact that Hagar is property, the fact that she has no agency, 
and is able to be given to Abram at Sarai's will, that Abram releases himself as all responsibility. It's not his decision. Oh, he's just listening to the voice of Sarai, or he's listening, Adam's listening to the voice of Eve to do this, but he's the one taking the action. She conceives. Hagar is naturally looking upon her mistress with contempt, like, how dare you force me to not only be raped, which is what's happening here, um, but also to not have possession of her own child. The intention of this relationship, this action, this um, um, non-consensual action is that Hagar is going to have to not consider her own child her heir. She was supposed to be a surrogate. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's, to put it nicely, yeah, yeah, as a surrogate. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then that upsets Sarah, who can't deal with the emotions that Hagar has, because Hagar shouldn't be a person. Hagar shouldn't have her own emotions. And so she wants to get rid of Hagar. Abram doesn't take responsibility here, says that Sarah can do whatever she wants. Sarah deals harshly with her, probably physical abuse, probably emotional abuse. And Hagar runs away. So her agency finally comes to pass in removing herself from the people of God. Quick questions or comments, and we'll come back to this. Okay. So we're going to deal with the messiness of this scene. We're going to get a promise made to Hagar very powerfully. Hagar is going to be the first person who verbally gives a name to God. Um, we've had kind of these references to the God Most High or to Yahweh, but there's going to be a new name given to God by Hagar. Um, all right, timeline. Um, next Sunday, Jen and I are going to be out on December 1st. And then our Board of Adult, um, our Board of Arts and Education, um, they sometimes schedule different adult education opportunities during this hour. Their focus this year is on mental health classes. So a couple of weeks ago after church, there was the one on kind of um, emotional intelligence and coping. Um, they're doing another one on the 8th on just kind of the concept of suicide and helping people in depression and suicidal thoughts. So that's going to be on December 8th. So we'll pick this back up on December 15th. So it'll be a little bit of a hiatus, give you some time to think about Hagar and Ishmael and what our Christian tradition has done to them. So any last comments or questions? All right, let's close in prayer. God, as always, we come to you with gratitude for this opportunity to study your scriptures. We thank you that the, the supposed heroes of our faith are, are people that fluctuate, oscillate between faith and doubt. It allows us to think about the ways in which our own faith does that and to give us permission to ask questions and draw closer to you however we can. We also recognize that these heroes are deeply flawed. And so we pray that we can have the religious humility to not elevate ourselves or these scriptural characters to pedestals that prevent us from pointing the finger at ourselves and saying that we all have room for growth and that it is incumbent upon us to have these discussions so that we can create more righteousness and justice in this world. In Christ's name, amen.